Welcome to the Equipping You in Grace podcast, hosted by Dave Jenkins. The Equipping You in Grace podcast is a podcast about helping Christians develop a biblical worldview in a conversational tone about issues inside and outside the church. Now, for today's episode, let's join our host, Dave Jenkins. Well, welcome back to the Equip You and Grace podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm the host for this show. And last time, we talked about uh, practical peace with God. How do we have peace with God? Well, we have peace with God through the death of Christ. When he said, Jesus said in John 19.30, it is finished. He established the very basis, the very ground on which our salvation stands. The very reason that we can call out to God is because of the death of Christ. And because he rose again from the grave, as we see in 1 Corinthians 1-8. through And as we talked about last time, this provides the foundation, it provides the fuel, this peace does, peace with God, it provides the fuel by which we can have practical peace, this peace that Paul talks about in Philippians 4, 6 through 8, this this peace that's being made real in our lives because we've been united to Christ by faith in his name and because we're indwelt by the Spirit. And so we're, we're progressively becoming more like Jesus because of this. We have a new identity because of Christ. This is what we call union with Christ. But today, today I want to, again, I want to lay a foundation as we, as we begin to talk about contentment. And we're going to be talking about contentment through uh, about the middle to end of, of April. I have some great author interviews uh, mixed in there on a variety of topics that I know that you're going to enjoy and you're going to love hearing uh, from the various people that uh, are going to come on the show. But, but today, I, I want to talk as well about biblical life change when we talk about sanctification there are there are two ways that we can talk about it one is positional sanctification or definitive sanctification now a positional or definitive sanctification what that means is because of what Christ has done we have a new identity in in Christ. Paul says to to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we are new creations in Christ. So every time that you see this phrase, in Christ, in him, in the Lord, that's referring to who you are as a child of God because of what Christ has done for you in his death, burial, and resurrection. And it's because of that, because of what Christ has done, that you then have the fuel, the ability to obey God by his grace and with his strength and with the help of the Holy Spirit. Because with the Holy Spirit, if we remember, what the Holy Spirit is intending to do is he's intending to take the truth that we read personally and that we're studying and that we're memorizing and meditating on the Word, and he's taking it through the ministry of the Spirit and applying it to our lives. So when you also corporately sit under the preaching of your biblically qualified local church pastor, what that is doing is is that ministry of the Word is is being, uh, you're being taught the Word, you're being taught to handle the Word, you're hearing the word preached and expounded lord willing verse by verse and line by line and what the spirit is going to do is he's going to take the the faithful preaching of the word and continue to apply it to your life bringing conviction and comfort uh through the ministry of jesus to you as a christian and so we're going to talk about what does this process today look like a biblical life change of growing to become like who we are now progressive sanctification of course is is exactly that it's becoming like who we are in christ it's a continual life as martin luther and john calvin described it's a life as calvin said the christian life is a life of repentance it's repentance at the start and it's repentance at the end he says so the christian life is one of we can say as luther Luther did uh, of repentance of ongoing repentance so biblical change or sanctification it is work now Paul explains three aspects of this process to change in Ephesians 4 22 through uh, 24 when he says that in reference to your former manner of life you laid aside the old self which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit and that you may be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth so to put off we must first identify 
what that old thought pattern was, that desire, that attitude, that behavior that needs to be removed and replaced. And second, being renewed in the spirit of your mind involves uh, submitting to the word of God, which is to inform and to shape our thinking, our desires, our affections, and our wills. The third step is the command to put on is to live out the life of Christ in us. We are not left to do this on our own. It is God who is at work in us so that we can be pleasing to him as you see in Philippians 2.13. So in this process of change, we must identify what needs to be put off, the habits, the patterns of the flesh, and we must identify what needs to replace them. One of the things that we all probably need to work on is anxiety. I worry. Worrying has been part of my life for many years. But indeed, old habits, as it's been said, die hard, right? Is change really possible for me? How do I stop worrying? Well, we must look first not to psychology or to those things. Those can be helpful tools, but not primary tools, not ultimate tools, meaning that we must first look to the word of God for our guidance, for our struggles, because God has something to say. Remember, this is a God who sees us and knows us and cares about it. And so Paul gives very specific instructions in a text like Philippians 4, 4 through 9. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to god and the peace of god which surpasses all comprehension will guard your hearts and your minds in christ jesus finally brethren whatever's true whatever's honorable whatever's right whatever's pure whatever's lovely whatever's of good of repute if there's anything of excellence if there's anything worthy of praise dwell on these things the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me practice these things and the god of peace will be with you there's the command to stop being anxious. We must put off our anxiety. We must remember, as Paul says here, the Lord is at hand. Paul is telling us what we're to put on because of who we are. What that means is I'm to replace anxiety with thankful prayer and self-controlled thoughts. I must put on faith and trust God's power, his wisdom, his goodness. And finally, Paul says in verse 9 of Philippians 4, practice these things. Practice, it means repetition. That means that I and you must keep at it daily going to the lord with our anxieties and casting them on him who cares as we see in first peter 5 7 i must practice trust and thankfulness change what i'm saying requires perseverance it requires continuing to go in the same direction day after day moment after moment not repeating those thoughts but taking them captive into the obedience of christ as paul tells the corinthians now, the process of putting off, of renewing the mind, of putting on is key not just to my anxiety and perhaps even yours, but is the method to deal with the attitudes or the behaviors in our lives that need to be changed. Now, biblical change, it requires effort, just like, you know, we need might need to change the oil or do the dishes or take out the trash or mow the lawn. But slowly, I and you can see progress, just like Paul said in 2 Corinthians 3.18. But we all, with unveiled faces, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same things, from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. You see, our sanctification, as we talked about earlier, is progressive. And in fact, in pursuing sanctification, we need the church, we need one another for encouragement, for godliness. How are you doing with your temptation to worry? Are you growing in your trust in the Lord and in his faithfulness? How can I pray for you? You know, these are questions that we should all be asking ourselves. And we should ask other people when they come to us. How are you doing it taking the truth? How are you doing it taking yourself by the hand and trusting the Lord as he's revealed himself to be in the word? It's a question. We all need to ask these types of questions. Now, two are definitely better than one in our pursuit of sanctification. We, we need one another. That's why there's over 50 one another passages. We're told to do life with one another in the local church. And we all deal with sins throughout our whole life. Maybe you are dealing with a different sin than I, but whatever it is, there's hope for biblical change. We don't have to stay stuck the way we are. You know, I haven't completely eliminated my propensity to worry. I'm continuing to work on it by putting it off and by putting on trust in the Lord through thankful prayer, meditation on the Word of God, help from other believers. And you know what? Over the years, I'm, I've seen much progress. I've seen much fruit. Seeing change in my life that pleases the Lord, it brings real hope and joy. And we can even give praise to the Lord and testify of His goodness.
Now, most people ha have something they want to see change, generally bad habits or even unhelpful attitudes. They show up at the top of the list. In fact, maybe even at the beginning of the year, you resolved to make resolutions. And maybe one of the things that you wanted to do was you really wanted to work on your walk with the Lord. And if you're a Christian, that's a great desire. So let me ask you the question. How are you doing at addressing habits? Have you, have you given up already towards the end of this month, the beginning of the year? Well, let's get back on the bandwagon. Let's get back to, to reading the Bible, even starting with one verse or a couple of verses, and then spend a few moments uh, uh, thinking and chewing over the Word, meditating on it. And then why not just pray about what, what you just meditated on, what you just read. Uh, that can take between five to ten minutes. Now, in, in the greater population, including many Christians, often these lists highlight the goal just to make yourself or your situation better. Now, as followers of Christ, our list of things that we want to change hopefully is informed more by the Bible than, than those things we would like to make life better. Now, the motivation for the follower of Christ to change, it should reflect an individual purpose of life. That is to become more like Christ, to become more like who we are in Him. Now, as we read, as we learn the Bible, alongside of the work of the Holy Spirit, we begin noticing things in our lives that need to change. As we grow in the Lord and, and we are under the preaching of, of God's Word through a biblically qualified uh, male pastor, the list focuses less on what we would simply make your life better as intense steps uh, to be more susceptive issues of behavior, thinking, attitudes, motives, and affections. And sometimes our list includes sins, sometimes issues of folly. For those of you with, with a stubborn something on your list that has been hard to change, there is hope. There is change. And change is possible not because of you, but because of Christ. Now, in Ephesians 4, 20 through 21, after describing the life of an unbeliever, Paul writes, But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus. Remember, in Jesus, in the Lord, in him, in Christ. This describes the identity, our union with Christ. And now Paul refers to your salvation as learning Christ, where the truth you accept is a truth about Jesus Christ revealed in the Word of God. For true change to take place, it's important to understand what you learn. Now, to do so, there are four key concepts to understand here in order to evaluate, evaluate yourself pertaining to learning Christ. Because you have heard the truth of the Bible and learned about sin, you acknowledge that you have both sinned and you are a sinner. Martin Luther, the Protestant reformer, called this a uh, simul justice el pector at the same time saint and sinner in other words sin impacts you two ways one you have committed acts of sin and two you are a sinner by nature and by choice and it's not enough to simply acknowledge sin you must take responsibility for it specifically you must recognize similar to david that the sin in your life in your heart is your sin not somebody else writing to god david wrote against you and you only have i sinned in psalm 51 David is saying that one must go to God in repentance and recognize not simply that sin does exist, but it's my sin. Every follower of Christ must own his or her personal sin and sin nature. This is part of being taught by Christ. Now, the next element of learning Christ is to seek and even pursue heart change. So after you acknowledge your sin, you humbly come before God and you ask his forgiveness for your sin. You ask him to change your heart. This means that you recognize that God fundamentally needs to change your inner man from what it is to what he wants. You ask God to accept what Jesus did on the cross as your personal substitute, as a payment for your personal sin through which you are accountable and apply Jesus' righteousness to your account. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And the final element of learning Christ, it involves a desire for life change. You begin to want to follow Jesus as your Lord. That, that's actually what discipleship means. It means that you are becoming a learner, a disciple of Christ. And not only that, but you're following him as Jesus taught in Luke 9.23-27. You're following Following him in all of life that we call this a cruciform pattern of life so you're not only learning Christ but you're following Christ this is why the disciples were called by Jesus to follow him to follow him pick up everything leave it leave it leave it behind and just follow him 
Are you doing that? Are you following Jesus today? Have, are you learning from Christ? Are you following him presently in this moment today in all of life? Are you following the pattern, not only his life and his death and his resurrection, but are you following him in obedience to his word? John 14, 15 says, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. And we need to remember that the re very reason that we can obey the commandments is because of what Christ has done. Christ makes it possible for us to obey him through the, through the grace of God that has saved us and through the present ministry of the Spirit. So do you want to change? That is, do you want your attitude, your thinking, your motives, and, and your behavior to all reflect the character of Christ in all of life? You, you seek and you pursue change at a whole new level when you start to see it this way. In every aspect of your life, you recognize the need to live holy as God is holy, righteous as Christ is righteous and pure. That doesn't mean that you're going to be perfect. This is a progressive work. This is a daily work. Remember, we talked about repentance. We have a great need of Christ, as Spurgeon said, and a great Christ for our need. This is why we need to continue to confess our sin and to trust the righteousness of Christ, as 1 John 1, 9 says. And so if you learn Christ in this way, then become a true follower of him. Follow him in all of life. In this sense, true change is possible because true change has already happened at a heart level if you're in the Lord. After all, you transition from a heart past feeling to a heart that now desires to become like your Savior and Lord Jesus, as we see in Colossians 1, 13 and 14, where Paul makes it very clear that if you are in Christ, you have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of the Lord Jesus. And so in Ephesians 4, 22 through 24, Paul explains this new heart and even provides true hope when he says that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt and according to the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you may put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So in these three verses, which I just read, Paul explains why and even how you have hope for change. Paul is saying that you can change and that there's hope for change. And he does this in three ways. Your old sinful disposition, which was dominated by your sin nature and made honoring God impossible, the Lord removed. In this text that we're talking about, Paul refers to your slavery to sin as the old man. He says that in Christ at salvation, your old man is to be put off. In the English language, it reads as if you put it off. But in reality, Christ is the one who puts it off of you. Similar to taking off a layer of clothes within which you're wrapped, as salvation, Christ takes off your old man. Now, notice how this old man is described. Corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Herein lies the problem. Your old man is dominated by your lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, as we see in 1 John 2. And because of your old man, the Bible calls you a slave of sin and without hope in the world. Even earlier in Ephesians, Paul described the one without Christ, who is not saved as having no hope and without God in the world, in Ephesians 2.12. And yet God gave you a new man. That is, he gave you a new and even a righteous disposition which desires to honor God and become like Christ. Notice how he describes it. This new man was made according to God, which reflects God's righteousness and God's holiness. God placed that on you on account of the righteousness of Christ alone. Similarly to the way God removed the old man, God closed you in the new man. You are wrapped in this new man, no longer a slave to sin and your lust, but now capable of living a holy and a righteous life. Where you once could only sin, now you uh, can choose to walk in the righteousness of God on account of Christ and through the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. In fact, not only can you choose righteousness, but you desire to walk in righteousness, to walk, as Paul said in Ephesians 5.1, to walk in a wor manner worthy of the calling that you've received. So God also began a new process in your mind known as renewal. God now begins to change or even renew your mind through his word and and by the work of the Spirit in you, the process God begins in your inner man. It provides you the new and even exciting opportunities to understand the significance of the Word of God. And as you grow in your understanding, you begin to have discernment and wisdom. The more the Word of God you know, the more the renewal process impacts you. You begin to recognize how loving God and loving your neighbor, it begins to play out in your day-to-day -day life. And furthermore, you, you see how you have choices, how what you want impacts your choices, and how what you worship ultimately matters 
matters in every sphere of your life. You begin to recognize worship as it relates to what you treasure. And so do you have hope? Absolutely. But not because you have the inherent ability to change, but because Christ makes change possible uh, since you have been clothed in the new man. Counseling is concerned with helping people change. And so this begs the question, how do we do that? Well, Dr. J. Adams endeavors to answer that question in his book, How to Help People Change the Four-Step Biblical Process. In part one of his book, Dr. Adams introduced the concept of biblical change. The goal of biblical change is pleasing God, and this is accomplished by the power of the Holy Spirit. The process of this change is laid out in 2 Timothy 3.16. It involves teaching, it involves convicting, it involves correcting and training in righteousness. Dr. Adams spends the remainder of the book expanding on this process step by step, line by line. Step one in the process is teaching. And so Dr. Adams explains that true biblical teaching is teaching that is habitually observing Christ's transcultural, unchanging, authoritative commands. This happens through the process of not only formal weekly counseling, but, but assigning homework that enables counselees to put God's word into practice in normal day-to-day -day situations. Step two is convicting. Conviction involves ministering the word in the power of the spirit in order that counselees realize that they are falling short of God's standards. So counselors must gather data, interpret it according to biblical categories, and even use it to help their counselors view their lives, i.e. actions, feelings, responses, words, and actions in light of the word of God. And so Dr. Adams also comments on the necessity to differentiate not only between needs and desires, but also between conviction and introspection. And so he points out out that the insufficiency of a mere change in thinking and hope in confronting sin and dullness of heart. Step three, correcting. It is the natural progression from convicting. And since counselors cannot see a man's heart, they must create observable opportunities for correction, which is why homework is necessary. Now, correction does not come without repentance, which encompasses confessing sin to God and men, seeking forgiveness from God through the, through the person and work of Christ, abandoning sinful practices, and beginning new uh, God-pleasing activities. Now, Dr. Adams, he provides an extensive explanation of the elements of true biblical repentance, such as confessing and forsaking sin and restoration within the body of Christ. In step four, training in righteousness, Dr. Adam contends that biblical counselors often miss this important step and make their counseling both incomplete and ineffective in helping counselees with continuing discouraging failure. Now, the counselor's goal is to help counselees who are already righteous in Christ flee self-righteousness and put on true Christ-like righteousness. Many are tempted to think this is impossible due to their continual battle with sin along with their understanding of Romans 7, 14-25. And yet, Dr. Adams reminds his readers that according to Romans 6, 1 Peter 4, and 1 John, righteous living is not only possible, it is promised and thereby expected. And one key to this training in righteousness is a concept of habit. Habits enable us to do our normal activities unconsciously. Sadly, we have trusted these blessings and developed sinful habits while living in the flesh. We need new habits by the power of the, the Word and by the Spirit. Such patterns need to be established before counseling sees. Now, there are several strengths in this book that make it a useful resource, particularly for younger biblical counselors. Well, first, Dr. Adams possessed a wonderful and even a rare ability to provide biblical steps, process, and even methods without delving into moralism and pragmatism. He always remains gospel-centered, God-exalting, and emphasizing the Spirit's power. Second, the case studies are wonderful illustrations that encourage counselors with the hope that they too can minister the scriptures in such a way that it encourages biblical change in people's lives. And finally, Dr. Dr. Adams addresses the issue of integrating psychology into counseling and delivers a robust and a concise defense of the sufficiency of the Word of God. You know what? This is vital in our day. In fact, it is an excellent resource that uh, Dr. Adams has provided in this book. So uh, as we land the plane on this episode, I just want to say a couple of last things. As we go throughout this series, we're going we're gonna to talk about a lot of things, and, and a lot of these things are going to be challenging. But I want you to remember that if you are in Christ, you belong to him. He is yours, and you are his forever. And, and part of this, this examination that we're going to walk through as we talk about uh, contentment, 
uh, and, and it's very in its various aspects in our life and pursuing contentment, which is a disposition of the heart. It's made possible because, like we talked about in the last episode, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That is, through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. We have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of the Lord Jesus. So we have hope, and that hope is grounded in, the, as Hebrews, the author of Hebrews says, in the sure anchor of, of Christ himself. God has come near on account of Christ uh, to sinners. He came under the sentence of death to pay the penalty that we justly deserve. And not only did he die, but he was buried and he rose again. And even now, he he serves as our high priest, our intercessor, the mediator of the new covenant. And he is soon returning. And so we, what we need to do is we need to take ourselves by the hand. And we need to remember the truth that we have in the word of God. We need to remember that, that Christ is truly sufficient in all of life. That we ha- have the, the help and the hope of the comforter, the Holy Spirit, who is helping us, even convicting us. And and even conviction is a blessing from the Lord. It's because he loves us, because he desires us to grow to be more like Christ, that he brings conviction into our life. And then he also brings comfort. He brings the help of the Spirit. He brings the help of his grace that super abounds towards us. And even right now, dear Christian, you have help. You have help in the Jesus, your high priest. You have G- help in Jesus, your advocate, who ever lives to plead the merits of his own blood, the treasure of his own blood before the Father. And so in every way possible that we can consider, from the personal work of Christ to the ministry of the Spirit to the Word of God, you can change, you can grow, and we need help in this area. So I hope that as we talk about uh, the various things that we're, where we ourselves need to apply contentment to our life, I hope that what you'll hear is, is it's possible to pursue contentment. It's possible to experience change in your life. It's possible to grow through uh, even the most stubborn and to address the most stubborn and habitual sins in our life. Don't make excuses about this. Take ownership of your sin, of the ways in which you are prone to wander and you feel it. Because the goal is, is that we can sing that that hymn, It Is Well With Our Soul, and we can actually believe it. That doesn't mean this side of eternity that will ever be perfect. There, there are stumbles and there are toils, there are hardships. We need to be reminded. We need help, and and that's okay. But I, but I hope that what this this series will do is it will really help you to grow through the seasons of your life, whether that's trials, whether that's uh, temptation, whether that's uh, suffering, or or whatever it is that you'll be equipped through this series to really handle better the seasons of your life, whether those good seasons, bad seasons, or whatever season, and to to find peace and help and hope that we have in Christ. That's what contentment is all about. That is why Paul said that he learned this. And we need to remember, this was the Paul who 2 Corinthians 11 tells us he was shipwrecked. He was beaten uh, within an inch of his life 39 times and so much more. And we need to remember as well that Jesus himself said in Acts 9 to Paul that he would suffer for the name of Christ. So we need to remember that because Jesus says in in John 16 that in this world you will have tribulation. And Paul told uh, Timothy that you can expect as a soldier of Christ to experience suffering. And so we're not promised a bed of roses. The Christian life is not easy, but we, we have peace. We have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And this peace, because of our union with Christ and through the ministry of the Spirit, is becoming even more real every day and should be becoming more real moment by moment as we're taking hold of the promises of God, as Second Corinthians one twenty says, more and more into our life, day by day, moment by moment, hour after hour, year after year, for the honor and glory of our King and of our Savior, who is utterly sufficient in every way and in every stage of life until he returns. Let us keep looking to Christ and trusting Christ. He's enough and he always will be. So coming up in the next few episodes, uh, we have Jim Osmond coming on. We're going to we're gonna talk about a variety of things like the, the New Apostolic Reformation and Deliverance Ministry uh, and, and much more and about his ministry, his books, uh, why he's written them and more. Uh, we also have uh, coming on after Jim Osmond, we have Justin Peters coming on. Really, really excited about uh, that 
that. Uh, and he's going to also talk about uh, the new Apostolic Reformation, Deliverance Ministry, and more. Uh, after Justin, we have uh, Holly Pivot coming on uh, with her new book, Reckless Christianity, The Destructive New Teachings and Practices of Bill Johnson, Bethel Church, and the Global Movement of Apostles and Prophets. Uh, then uh, my wonderful wife, Sarah, we're going to do an episode on Valentine's Day, and we're going to talk about you know genuine love and loving one another. And then we're going to go back um, after that. We're going to talk about how do we apply contentment to our marriage. Uh, then I have my friend and sister in Christ, Haley Williams from Kindled Podcast, a great podcast. If, you, uh, if you've never heard of her, we're going to have her on again. This is the second time. She's going to talk with us about the If Gathering, which is a huge movement uh, uh, it has lots and lots of people. Um, then at the end of February, we're going to have Dr. Stephen Wellam coming on about his book, Systematic Theology, Volume 1, From Canon to Concept. Uh, really excited about that. Then at the end of, of February, I'm going to talk about with you about applying contentment to suffering. And then, Lord willing, uh, we have a bunch of episodes coming uh, in March and April and through the rest of the year. And uh, so, yeah, there's a lot of great content coming uh, on the, on Equip You and Grace. Of course, we have loads and loads of content already on our website, uh, over 10 year plus years of our magazine, Theology for Life, over 500 uh, episodes of this podcast of Equip You and Grace. Uh, we have uh, over 200 episodes of the theology segment, answering people's questions, and, and so much more. So we have over 300 plus writers on Servants of Grace. So just as we wrap up this episode, I really want to encourage you, if you haven't already, to go to servantsofgrace.org, and there um, you're going to find all of our resources. But I, I would just encourage you as a listener, if you regularly watch or listen to this show, I just want to encourage you, in addition to first giving to your local church, um, I want to encourage you to, to please consider supporting our ministry. Um, you can do that through going to the Servants of Grace shop, and, and uh, there you'll find my books, uh, The Word Explored and The Word Matters, um, and, and also this book, Contentment, The Journey of a Lifetime. But also we have over 300 plus products from, from stuff for men and, and women and kids. We have clothes, we have hats, we have journals, we have more. Uh, the money there goes to support our ministry. Um, if you'd like to donate, you can do that as well. Um, it's under the About tab, uh, and just click giving uh, the money does go to support our ministry as we continue to make disciples and make disciples for the honor and glory of god well i want to thank you for listening or watching this episode of equip you in grace please continue to tell your friends about us and until next time may god bless you and keep you Thank you for listening to the Equipping You and Grace podcast. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe, rate us on the app, and share this with your friends and family on social media. If you want to find us on social media, you can find us on Twitter at Servants of Grace, on Instagram at Servants of Grace, or by searching at Servants of Grace on Facebook. You can also find this episode and many others like it on the front page of our website, servantsofgrace.org.